The BBC presents My Word. And here to introduce the programme and the panel is Jack Longland. My Word is a word game played by people whose business is words, and this programme comes to you from the Commonwealth Institute in London. And those taking part are Dillis Powell, Frank Muir, Anne Scott James and Dennis Norton. Here's round one to test their vocabulary. Two marks if they get the meaning of the following words right. Dillis Powell, what is ectoplasm? Ectoplasm is concerned with spiritualism. Mm -hmm. And um, <laughs> gifted mediums like Frank <laughs> <laughs> produce uh, or appear to produce in their mouths a, a substance which may be there or may not be there, but which forms itself into something or other. Absolutely right. Two marks. It's a supposed viscous substance exuding from the body, I think usually from the mouth, like Frank did, of a spiritualistic medium during a trance. Now, Dennis Norton. Dennis, what is Rosie Ola? <laughs> I, I, I know it's medical and I think it's indelicate. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't think you can have shingles in indelicate places. If, if they meet in the middle, you, you're, yeah, you, you've had it, yeah. I don't know, rosy oil. It's either that or it's some kind of fizzy drink made with roses. <laughs> uh, it, it is a medical term. It's the rosy red rash that afflicts you in measles, and it's also the name given to the other kind, which is German measles. Now, Anne Scott James. Anne, what's the meaning of pseudorific? Well, rowing the boat trace would be pseudorific. It means sweat making. That's it. It means that exactly. <laughs> now, Frank, go. Frank, what is a sour sop? Sour sop? Mm. A sour sop is a milk sop in a thunderstorm. <laughs> <laughs> it's a perfectly splendid idea, Frank. I can't give you any marks for it yet. Or a spongy lemon. Yes. It's a fruit, like a lemon. It comes from the West Indies. And it's also the name of the tree on which the fruit grows. And I do, in fact, know the name of the tree, and that's all I do know, which is called Anona muricata. Two marks it is. Well, before we begin round two, I give each team a quotation for them to write down. And I hope that the two women members of the team will go on studying those quotations, because at the end of the program, I shall ask them where the quotations come from. Now, Dillis Powell and Frank Muir, your quotation is... Oh, pardon me, thou bleeding piece of earth. And Anne Scott James and Dennis, yours is more matter with less art. And then at the end of the program, I shall ask Frank and Dennis to give me their idea of how these came to be said or written. Well, on now to round two, which is a round of odds and ends. Two marks are correct answers. Dennis Powell, what is or was the king's evil? Something comes to my head called scrofula. Yeah, absolutely rightly. It was called the king's evil because there was a belief that if the king touched you, he could cure it. Yes, absolutely right. Well done. Dennis Norton, who wrote Lamb's Tales from Shakespeare? <laughs> well, <laughs> it's a chance in a million, but I'll take it. Lamb. <laughs> <laughs> One lamb or two? Two. <laughs> 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 All right. <laughs> two marks it is. Charles Lamb and his sister Mary Ann Lamb um, wrote these short prose versions of the, well, the, the more respectable of Shakespeare's plays, and uh, Mary did the comedies and Charles did the others. And Scott James, what is the Almanac de Gotha, G-O-T-H-A, Almanac de Gotha? Well, it's the sort of 400 of Germany. It's the, um, the Brett of Central Europe. One and a half out of two. It's a genealogical, this is the bit where the nobility come in, a genealogical, diplomatic and statistical 
annual, but it covered all the states of the world. And it's been published in French since 1763 by Justus Perthes of Gotha. Mm -hmm. Now, Frank, what and where is the Bridge of Sighs, and why is it so called? Ah, yes, right. <coughs> you're in Venice, <laughs> on a gondola, right about the middle, and you're in the Grand Canal, up the north end, towards the Lido. Mm -hmm. Right, can you, uh, got a picture? Yes. <laughs> St. Mark's Square is in front of you, on the right-hand side, there's a frightful sort of pale pink square birthday cake, which Doge's is the Doge's Palace. Palace. <laughs> and there's a little canal that goes alongside that. And there's a rather grey, dreary building beside that, which is the old prison. Mm -hmm. Right. Now, <laughs> incline your eyes slightly upwards, mm -hmm. and bridging the Doge's Palace and the prison is a rather sinister enclosed bridge, mm -hmm. arched. And that is the Bridge of Sighs, because when the prisoners were condemned by the Doge, they were then hustled across the bridge into the prison. Two marks. Well done. Well, now a round of who, why, and what questions. Again, two marks for correct answers. Uh, Dennis Powell, what is or was Attic Salt, S-A-L-T? Attic Salt was kind of wit. Why? Uh, well, because it was um, expected from the Athenians. Yes. And why did they call it salt? Any particular reason? Because salt is a kind of um, sharpens you up. Yes, I think that'll do. Two marks. Uh, Attic salt is ele elegant or delicate wit. Uh, Attica is where Athens was. And both in Latin and Greek, salt was a common term for wit, for sparkling thoughts which were well expressed. Dennis Norton. What do we refer to as dark meat and white meat, and why? Because <laughs> they're dark meat. Well, that's a soppy question. We refer yes. to dark so meat obvious. as dark meat, and we refer to white meat as white meat. <laughs> and why we do it is because it's the only way you can distinguish between the two. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, <laughs> casting your mind to a particular sort of meaty object, which bit is which? The breast is the lighter bit, and the, the, but why is it? Well, you mean that because we don't like to say bosom and leg, That's right. breast. Yeah. That's right. Absolutely right. Yeah. You've, got, you've got there, you've got your two marks. <laughs> Very well done. Dark meat and white meat are usually the dark-coloured leg meat and the white-coloured breast meat in poultry, and they used, of course, to be called, as they should be, breast and leg meat. <clears throat> but the Victorians stopped all this because it was very indelicate to use such words as breast meat and leg meat. My wife is very fond of the clerical bit. <laughs> uh, well, Anne Scott James now. Why don't we speak of having roast pig and roast sheep for dinner? Well, it's a euphemism, it sounds nice. Why? You, do, and, and you just don't time? like to think of that thing after you had it in the backyard, running around with all its little fluffy <laughs> wool on. You don't want to say, have some sheep. It's, it's Absolutely a... no marks at all. Oh. <laughs> oh. Um, these terms were pig and sheep were considered frightfully lower class, and it was uh, correct to adopt the French terms of pork and mouton, and it goes right back to the time when the Normans took over, and when French was the court language. Frank Muir, why is Monday called Monday, and what's the meaning of Monday-ish? I was, was always taught to believe that it was Moon Day. You were absolutely right. And uh, Monday-ish means uh, <coughs> a touch of the drearies, really. Because <laughs> one, one faces the week ahead. In other words, the frivolity of the weekend is over. And uh, hard work sets in. That's good enough. That's two. And there is a slight um, um, gloss on your last bit. It is the, the moon's day, just as Sunday was the sun's day. Monday, in fact, began among people who worked too hard or thought they had on Sunday. It, it was used among the clergy, feeling it had a frightfully heavy day on Sunday, and therefore on Monday you felt Mondayish. But now, as Frank's quite right, nowadays we use all of us use it if we're feeling a bit slack and hungover on Monday morning. On our round of words which are pretty difficult, but in order to help members of the team to give the meanings, we've tried to put them into a sentence in their proper context. From the scene described, can you tell me in your own words what happened or is about to happen? And the difficult word gives the answer. Three marks if you get these things right. 
In Victorian days, a nicely brought up young lady was innocent of such matters, so that it was not until the start of her honeymoon that poor little Lavinia Tightlace discovered to her horror that her new husband was a crinite man. C-R-I-N-I-T-E. A crinite man. Well, I can only concede he had a, had a mane. Yes, well, nearly. He had a mane. Well, yes, put it another way. Well, he cried I wouldn't like I wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't like to go any further. <laughs> he had a mane. Yes, you have he a mane. He was very hairy. Yes, that's absolutely right. Well done. Three marks. <laughs> <laughs> Now, Dennis Norton, the man looked down gloatingly at the girl who was his prisoner. What are you going to do, she asked tearfully. The man smiled evilly. I am going to muir you. He oh, said. charming. <laughs> charming. <laughs> Poor kid. <laughs> Uh, slight variation of spelling, M-U-R-E. Well, to muir means to send up the wall. <laughs> <laughs> Eventually it might. Or, or end wall. Yes, well, you've got the whole sense of it, Dennis. But, in prison. Uh, you... Oh, I see, in, in prison. Is That's it? it. Oh, yes, I see. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, sorry, in prison. Three marks it is. Muir means to confine, as if in prison, to shut up. And similar to the word immuir. <laughs> In my dictionary of names, it says young and noble. <laughs> <laughs> Anne Scott James. The lady explorer continued with her lecture. And what is more, she said, throughout my journeys in Australia and New Zealand, I can honestly say that I never found a catipo under my bed. <laughs> K A T I P O. An insect. Mm -hmm. Yes, a rather nasty, um, dangerous, biting, stinging insect. All right, two out of three. <laughs> Catipo is a venomous black spider that lives in those parts. Frank Muir has a Russian one, in case I get the pronunciation wrong. Alexis snorted contemptuously. My poor Ivanovich, he sneered. I'm afraid that your kumis is worse than your kvass. <laughs> <laughs> Filthy. <laughs> well, this one, isn't it? Kvass is a drink. Yes? It's a, it's a sort of homemade drink. Mm -hmm. In the Russias, it, it's very popular. Yeah. And traditional. And kumis? Kumis? Isn't it? It's been another drink. Yes? Another drink. <laughs> yes. A bit stronger than the other one. Yes, absolutely right. Kumis is a fermented drink made from mare's milk, and kvass is Russian rye beer. And now we come to the last round and go back to those quotations I gave the two teams earlier in the program. For two marks, Dennis Powell, can you give me the origin of the quotation, Oh, pardon me, thou bleeding piece of earth. It's spoken by Mark Antony in his funeral oration over the body of Caesar in Shakespeare's Julius Caesar. All right, that's two marks it is. Now, Anne Scott James, the origin of your quotation, more matter with less art. Well, I think it was spoken by Gertrude yeah. in Hamlet or the Prince of Denmark <laughs> by William <laughs> Shakespeare. Absolutely well, right, two, two marks yeah. again. And now I'm going to ask Dennis and Frank to give me their explanations of how these quotations came into being. And on this occasion, the marks will go to whichever incredible explanation receives the longer applause from the audience here in the theater. So back to Frank Muir. Oh, pardon me, thou bleeding piece of earth. If a stranger came up to me and said, tall sir, what is your most awful experience? I wouldn't have to wreck my brains. I would know instantly. The whole thing was entirely my wife's fault. You see, I went to Corsica with my wife. It's to be a second honeymoon. Fool that I was. It was to be a sort of second honeymoon. And there we were. We decided one evening to drive into this uh, little town of Calvi, which has nightlife at Calvi. And we parked on a, up in the citadel in front of some green doors which said Garage Militaire, um, whatever that means. And, uh, and we decided to go skipping across the beach of Calvi under the trees. When we collected the car, there was a little bit of white paper 
under the windscreen wiper. And my wife said, that's a papillon. So I said, no, it's a bit of white paper. <laughs> so she knows, no, in French, that's what they, it's a butterfly. They call it, when you get a summons, a parking summons, they put this little white paper, which flutters, and the French call it uh, a papillon, a butterfly. And I shoved it in my pocket and said, well, let's go and eat, and then we'll, we'll look at it. So uh, where should we park the car? And then we drove down to the quay, and my wife said, look, there's one of those underground car park things there. There's a lovely... Um, expense, there's a few cars in it, no huge open space, and it's undercover and lights. So I drove up this little ramp thing and parked the car, and we went and had this meal up in the Citadel, which was good uh, Corsican meat, which is rather like eating the soles of one of those shoes, which is guaranteed <laughs> for a year. And we went back to collect the car, and it wasn't there, and neither was the car park. <laughs> <laughs> and we heard... Vroom, vroom, and we saw this ship just sailing away, you see, <laughs> rather in the direction of the mainland. Anyway, we, we got the plane over to France and collected the car off the boat. And suddenly, there was a complete general strike. <laughs> and all ships were stopped sailing between the coast of France and islands like Corsica. And it was three weeks later, we arrived back in Corsica. We drove like fury to, towards the gendarmerie at Calvi, and uh, I stopped for a wash and brush up and, uh, in our little place. And in the three weeks, one of those things, my hair grows rather quickly. And rather than face the gendarmes like this, I got out a pair of scissors, looked in the bathroom mirror, adjusted the wings of the bathroom mirror, and cut the back of my hair with a pair of nail scissors. Now, the most extraordinary thing is that your <laughs> brain works in a peculiar way, and you think you're, when you're looking in the mirror, you think your arm's going that way. <laughs> and actually, it's good. Well, I cut an eighth of an inch off the bottom of my left ear. <laughs> because we were in this terrible hurry, and there was bleeding profusely. So I reached in my pocket and found a little bit of paper and tore a bit off and <laughs> stuck it on the bottom of my ear and stinched the flow of blood. And we arrived at the gendarmerie, and there was a very, very nasty gendarme indeed there, very big and fat. And I handed him the, our little uh, papillon, which is rather crumpled, which is in my and he looked at it and he gave me a form a little form to fill in name address I wrote that in and he said occupation there was only a tiny little space I couldn't say well for many years I was um, co-writer with Dennis Norton and <laughs> so I put half author <laughs> <coughs> and he looked up and he burst into a terrible laugh laughter and kept on making terrible remarks like which half and what does the other half do and this sort of thing it struck him as terribly funny then he smoothed out the papillon and said, Où est le numéro? So I turned anxiously to my wife. What did he say? What did he say? He said, Where's the number? The number was missing from the papillon. So I thought for long and hard for a moment, reached up to my ear, <laughs> removed the little piece of paper I'd stuck on my ear, unwound it, and it was the number <laughs> from my papillon, <laughs> covered in blood. But then, of course, he said, Ah, merci. Then, of course, my ears started bleeding again, <laughs> all over his desk and everything. And he, he was half laughing and half furious, the blood all over the thing, and suddenly he scribbled up the paper, thrust it towards me, and started shouting and waving his arm. Well, imagine my predicament. There I was, bleeding to death. I said, what is it? And I said, listen to what he's saying. Why don't you learn French? He's saying, a pardon may thou bleed in peace, half author. <laughs> <laughs> things happen in France. Now we go on to Dennis Norton, and if you remember, his quotation was, more matter with less art. Well, this quotation was very much banded about just after my 14-year-old nephew had his accident. You, you probably read about young Arthur's accident. He got his head stuck through a hole in a Henry Moore statue. <laughs> Well, you see, he was, he was being taken round the National Gallery and he saw this great sculpture of Henry Moore's called The Mother. He's a bit, bit dim, young Arthur. And something in his twisted little mind associated it 
with a comic photograph he'd had taken at Brighton the previous summer. <laughs> On the pier, they have these cardboard cut-out figures with a hole at the top where you stick your face in. Now, you know Henry Moore's very characteristic sculpture. Arthur saw this hole. He thought, I'll have another photograph. And before he could say knife, his head was through it. And he couldn't get it out. <laughs> Well, of course, there was ructions about it, and they tried all sorts of ways, and it was all over the papers that evening. And around about half past 11, the curator came round to see me about it to enlist my help. Well, I couldn't understand his agitation because I don't really know very much about sculpture. When he started carrying on and said, Mr. Norden, you realise the only way we can extricate your nephew is to smash the statue. I said, well, yeah, that's, you know, do you want the lend of a sledgehammer? You know. And he sort of looked very taken aback, and he said, that statue of Henry Moore's is one of the cultural treasures of the world. Are we to demolish this masterpiece of the ages simply in order to extricate one foolish schoolboy? So I looked at him a bit funny, you know, and I said, what are you suggesting? He drew a deep breath and he said, I'm asking you whether you can persuade his parents to let him stay there. <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, it doesn't promise much of a future for the <laughs> child, does it? He said, I promise you we will do everything in our power to keep his life as normal as possible <laughs> under the circumstances. In fact, the Arts Council have promised us a special grant. So he said, Mr. Norden, it's that child or the statue. And I said, well, well let's go along and see Arthur, you see. I must say, young, young Art was very, uh, very cheerful under the circumstances, you know. Hello, Uncle. He said, uh, got me head stuck. Mm. <laughs> you know, because he, he's, he's dim but observant, you know. <laughs> sort of, you know, baden powell teeth. And I said, Arthur, what are you doing there? He said, I've got them all going, haven't I? And I realised there was something in his tone that was relish. Mm. I said, you're enjoying this, aren't you? He didn't say anything. And I decided it was time for the psychological approach. I said, Arthur, what size collar do you take? He said, ten and a half. I said, well, from very shortly now, you'll be taking size eight and a half. <laughs> he said, why? I said, because we're going to go round to the back of you, seize your feet and pull very hard and long. He said, do you think I'd come out? I said, you will come out. Your ears might not. Before I'd finished <laughs> the sentence, he was standing by my side. <laughs> and it was after this that this quotation began to appear in the papers because they'd all carried the photographs. You see, they did this great sort of before and after thing. They showed the photograph of Arthur within the Henry Moore statue, you know, with a caption which said, Henry Moore's the mother <laughs> with young Arthur inside, you see. <laughs> and then they showed the empty statue with a caption, Moore Mater with less art. <laughs> well, that means that by your vote, the contest of the stories is won by Dennis Norden, but it brings us to a final score in which, nevertheless, Dillis Powell and Frank Muir win the entire contest by four marks from Anne Scott James and Dennis, and that also brings to an end this edition of My Word. In My Word, you heard Dillis Powell, Anne Scott James, Frank Muir, and Dennis Norton, introduced by Jack Longland. The program was devised by Tony Schreien and Edward J. Mason, and presented by the BBC.
BBC presents My Word. And here to introduce the programme and the panel is Jack Longland. My Word is a word game played by people whose business is words. And this programme comes to you from the Commonwealth Institute in London. And those taking part are Anne Scott James, Dennis Norden, Dillis Powell, and Frank Muir. <laughs> Round one tries to test their vocabularies. Two marks if they get the meaning of these words approximately right. Anne Scott James. Anne, what is a fustanella? F-U-S-T-A-N-E-L-L-A, fustanella. It's a sort of mini skirt. Is it all that mini? Yes, fairly mini. Fairly, well, above the knee. Yes, and who wears it? It's a, uh, the, one of the sort of pleated jobs that the Evzones wear. The Greek um, national soldier. Yes. All right, and colour? Soldier, colour? Hmm? White. Yeah, <laughs> two marks. Uh, fastanella, uh, well, uh, my definition in the dictionary is a stiff, full petticoat made of cotton or linen and white. But petticoats are normally worn under skirts, whereas this is worn, as far as I understand it, on top. Frank Muir. What? What's the meaning of bobbish? Bobbish. 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 Well, Jolly. What? Jolly. Jolly. Why? Cheerful. Cheerful, we think. Happy. <laughs> Hello. Why? Brisk or well or in good spirits. And it's the same as sort of bobbing up and down like a cork, I think. Bobbish. Two marks. Dennis Powell, what is a... Portress, P-O-R-T-R-E-S-S, portress. A female porter. Where? In a jail. That'll do. <laughs> Two marks. Um, also, I think, a nunnery. Really? Yeah. Dennis Norton, what is a crupper? C-R-U-P-P-E-R, crupper. Something to do with horses. Yes, very much so. Well, when you heave the lady up behind you on the saddle. Is it? Okay. <laughs> when you elope. You what? Stick her on the crupper. Crupper. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, which end of the horse? Behind you. She, she would ride pillion. Now, yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, look, uh, it is perfect to us, uh, Dennis said, that crupper or cruppers are the hindquarters of a horse, but uh, as a device, it's the strap which is buckled onto the back end of your saddle and then rather unkindly is looped under the horse's tail. The point is to stop your saddle sliding forwards, which would be probably unfortunate if you were jumping or anything of that sort. Before we start round two, I give each team a quotation for them to write down, and I hope the two women members of the teams will keep on studying those quotations, because at the end of the programme, I shall ask them where the quotations come from. And Anne Scott James and Dennis Norden, your quotation is, there is but one step from the grotesque to the horrible. <laughs> and Dennis Bowden Frank, yours is, take thy beak from out of my heart. <laughs> And then at the end of the programme, I shall ask Dennis and Frank to give me their idea of how these came to be said or written. Now a round of origins and derivations, and I shall try and give three marks, members of the team who can define, first of all, the present meaning, and then give me the origin and derivation of these words or expressions or phrases. We begin again with Anne Scott James and macadamise. Well, it's what you do to roads. Yeah. It means you sort of tar them and make them slightly less bumpy than they would be otherwise. And it, it comes it was... from a gentleman called Macadam. Yes. And who was Macadam? He was a Scotsman. <laughs> <laughs> he was made the, roads. He was the first Scotsman. That's, no, well, the 19th century <laughs> Scotsman. <laughs> <laughs> Um, in thanks to him, uh, vast areas of this are called tarmac. <laughs> yes, this is the difficult. The tar came later. This was a system of road making introduced by John London Macadam about nineteen eight, sorry, about eighteen twenty. It meant putting down layers of stones, all of which were of roughly the same size, and then letting them be crushed into position, making a solid foundation originally by the traffic, but later on by heavy rollers. And he was a chap who made his fortune in New York, came back to Scotland and thought the roads were absolutely frightful there, and wrote a treatise in 1819 on how to make them better, 
And really, essentially, we've used this ever since. Thank me, maudlin. Yes, it means um, sentimentally tearful. Yes. I, I didn't mean to say that to, <laughs> to my wife. I love her, really. <laughs> she loves her. <laughs> like that. Yes. Maudlin, like that. <laughs> and it comes from, innovations, from Maudlin College. <laughs> Good. Well, it's quite true, because in the lecture halls there, the students sit in tears. <laughs> uh, as Frank quite rightly says, Maudlin means you're crying too easily or being mawkishly sentimental and often associated with being drunk as well. But it does come from Mary Magdalene, who repented in the Bible bitterly of her sins, and in consequence she was shown in all the old paintings as being in tears and with her eyes red from weeping. And so, from her name, this uh, word Madeleine, uh, shortened to Maudlin, came to mean excessive weeping. Two marks. Delispal, pole, P O W L. It means the, the act of voting or the result yeah. of it. Yes. And how does it come to mean that? Yeah. The head. And how did, what's the connection between the two? Well, now. Uh, you had a vote per head. That's, it. That's what I wanted. Three marks you get. <laughs> Dennis Norton, confetti. Well, I would say it's Italian. Yes. Con is with. With fetti is short for fettuccine, which oh, yes. is um, <laughs> a type of spaghetti. What they used to do <laughs> was they used to throw little fragments of spaghetti. Um, but they abandoned this because of the white bridal dress. It wasn't so much the spaghetti, it was the bolognese sauce. <laughs> uh, and Dennis, they substituted paper. Dennis, move on a course or two, and, and you've got it absolutely right. It's what you have after the meat course. Oh, they threw coffee, roast beef. <laughs> <laughs> they what? threw cheese, small... Um, like a comfort. It's just little sweets. Isn't That's it. it? Those That's little tiny sweetie things. Yes, they threw sweets. Yeah. All right, little you get tiny your round... Three marks, it's quite right. Um, confetti nowadays has degenerated into these scraps of it, what look afterwards rather dirty coloured paper. You throw brides and bridegrooms and things. Um, but originally they were rather nicer about it. They made lots and lots of tiny sweetmeats and candies, which they called confetti, which simply means confectionery. And on carnival days and at weddings, people pelted each other with these sweets you could afterwards eat. And then one day a sort of tycoon turned up and thought it was much cheaper to make imitation sweets out of coloured plaster, and then they threw them for a bit, and then the English made it cheaper still and didn't even have to pay for the plaster, and we just simply throw little bits of paper at each other. But originally it means confectionery. Three marks. Well, now a round of fairly difficult words which have been put into a sentence so as to show in each case the word in its uh, recognisable and correct context. Two marks for explaining what's going on, the clue is given in the difficult word. Some marks can be awarded just for ingenuity. And Scott James, all the members of the Women's Institute gathered round to inspect Mrs. Broadbeam's Budlier, which had won first prize. Oh, well. Oh, well. What am I supposed to be doing about that? What is it? A Budlier? Mm. Ah, well, it's a flowering shrub. Flowers August to October, sweet smelling and attracts butterflies. You prune it in the spring. Jolly good. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can hardly dare ask, but colour of flowers? Oh, it can be. Peace is white. A very good one called Royal Red, which is bright red, but generally mauve. <laughs> I think we should give an extra bonus half mark, two and a half marks for a real erudition. Um, it is a kind of shrub with, I think... And but you will contradict me if I'm wrong. It has more often either lilac or mauve, mauve uh, uh, the, uh, yellow flowers, and it has other kinds. Mauve. And it gets its name from a jolly nice chap called Mr. A. Adam Buddle, who was an 18th-century botanist. Frank Miller, when asked by the magistrate, defendant declared, "I socked him in the kisser because he trod on my skipper key." I always understood that to be in a bacon sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> That's a butty. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, my partner is suggesting a dog. Yes, what kind of dog? 
It's a big dog. <laughs> or uh, contra- on the yeah, contrary. You dog. were thinking of a very large <laughs> version of a uh, small dog. It's a dog. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah, and not- the country it comes from, the name does help. Well, it's uh, not from these shores. Dutch? Yes, Dutch. Dutch. Dutch All right, you get your two marks. Um, a shipper or skipper is a kind of Dutch lap dog, and it literally means a little boatman. It gives you an idea of the size. Dennis Bob. It was apparent that the poor girl's false cilia were giving her palpebritis. Well, false lashes. Giving her palpebritis. They were trembling. No, this is a, 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 a sort of infection. P-A-L. So I assist. Pal- yes, yes, that's right. No. One and a half. Um, cilia is Latin for um, eyelashes or the kind of fringe you get on a leaf or wing of an insect. But palpebritis is information not so much of the eyes, of the eyelids. And uh, Latin word palpebra means eyelid. One and a half. And now one for Dennis Norton. Asked to state under oath exactly what he'd seen, the witness said firmly, when I saw the young couple on Hampstead Heath, they were doing a poussette together. Well, it's French. <laughs> yes. Um, poussette... Is to push. Yes. <laughs> I mean, she was a, she, she she was a, I yeah, think. She was a pushover, I think. <laughs> <laughs> they were indulging in, in small pushes. <laughs> as opposed to the big push, which is a military term. A um, pushy sort of dance, do you yes. think? Yeah, they're doing a pushy sort of dance. You know, they're hugging each other and pushing around the floor. It's highly improbable that anybody would say that. I think that's good enough. I give you two marks. Mm. A poussette is a dance in which the couple join hands and they dance round and round with another couple or their own, just as they prefer. And as Dennis rightly says, it comes from the French word poussé, to push. And now we come to the last round and go back to those quotations I gave the two teams earlier in the programme. Two marks and Scott James... Can you give me the origin of your quotation? There is but one step from the grotesque to the horrible. Well, frankly, no. I can only um, guess it might be Oscar Wilde. It's about the right date, but it's not quite that kind of literature. About the right, not that kind of literature. Um, criminal. Criminal. Um, oh, a thriller. Yeah. Sherlock Holmes. Yes. <laughs> it's uh, Conan Doyle and Sherlock Holmes is speaking it's his last bow a collection of stories right at the end and this story I think is called West Terrier Lodge there is but one <laughs> step from the grotesque to the horrible now Dillis Powell the origin of your quotation please take thy beak from out of my heart well it's a bird, bird. <laughs> yes, it's, a bird. it's a bird yes uh, it's a destructive bird, it's a raven. Yes, and author? Edgar Allan Poe. Well done, two marks you get. <laughs> well, now I'm going to ask Dennis and Frank to give me their explanation of how these quotations came into being. And on this occasion, the marks will go to whichever incredible explanation receives the longer applause from the audience here in the theatre. So back to Dennis Norton and his quotation. There is but one step from the grotesque to the horrible. Let me tell you why I gave up school teaching mm-hmm. as a profession. It was because of what they call the new maths. <laughs> now, when I was a pupil, I learnt maths by what they call, we used to call the gazinta system. <laughs> which, as you know, is like two gazinta four, four gazinta <laughs> eight, you know, and so on. But when I joined this first school as a teacher, the headmaster told me, he said, we use the new math which is teaching empirically. We call it learning by doing. In other words, if you have these sums, like if Arthur has five oranges and he gives John three, how many has he left? We do it with oranges. (laughs) So I took my first form, the lower third, under this system to teach them um, adding and subtracting, 27 boys, 118 oranges. (laughs) After three months of passing them backwards and forwards between them, they had 
just about got the principles of adding and subtracting. And the place smelt like Covent Garden. <laughs> hot night, but it was worth it. As a teacher, you get that special glow that comes to a teacher when he sees that dawn of understanding on a young boy's face. At least I did until one boy said to me, that's smashing, sir. Does it work with apples? <laughs> anyway, from there, we progressed. And so I went up through the school this way, but then I was given the prize form, the fifth form, for their O-level. O-level physics. For the benefit of overseas listeners, an O-level is not a fancy term for your pain threshold. <laughs> uh, it's an examination that all fifth form boys uh, have to pass in order to get into the sixth form. Now, we started off all right, I think. We were all right because we started off on the different temperatures of boiling liquids. We did that empirically and it worked out because I had this marvellous anti-burn lotion. <laughs> which sold it, but then we had this other one coming up, which I knew was going to throw me, and I knew there was going to be trouble. <clears throat> Archimedes' principle. <laughs> if a body is immersed in water, <laughs> it displaces its own weight. And I saw them, and I said, boys, will you just believe it if I tell it to you? <laughs> and they said, no, sir, show us. <laughs> so I said, well, let's take a glass of water and put a stone inside. They said, it's not a stone, so it says a body. <laughs> well, that's how I finished up, lying in this bath, which was half filled with water. And they'd worked out this principle that I got in a bath, fully clothed. <laughs> they then placed this board on top of me, on top of my body, and clamped it down. <laughs> The whole area of water above that board represented the water I displaced. They bored a hole in the side of the bath. They were going to unplug that hole. As the water poured out, they were then going to measure it and weigh it. And if it weighed the same as I weighed, one up to Archimedes. <laughs> well, we got as far as me getting in the bath they clamped me down with this board. Now, there's another thing about this headmaster that I didn't tell you. He had this craze for what he called unexpected fire drills. <laughs> <clears throat> now, in 90 seconds, I was alone in that bathroom. And what's more, they got down to the playground so quickly, he gave them the rest of the afternoon <laughs> off. <laughs> Now, that was when I began to have doubts about the teaching profession. Did I mention it was a Friday afternoon? <laughs> By nine o'clock Monday morning, when they finally came and unclamped the board, I had given up the teaching profession. <laughs> As I said to the headmaster at the time, there is but one step from the grotesque to the O-level. <laughs> Speaking as a professional, that was a wickedly accurate analysis of the newest methods of teaching maths, which <laughs> we thanked Dennis Norton. Well, now we go on to uh, Frank Muir, and if you remember, his quotation was, Take thy beak from out of my heart. Chaps. <laughs> Chaps often stop me and say, Sandy, do you ever regret the old days, the old escapades like the 39 Steps, Green Mantle? And I say, no, 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 not at all, don't you know? I've retired, you know, I've got this little house near Egham, quite nice, with a garden. I know uh, people often say to me, Egham, Sandy, my God, man, that's the suburbs. And I say, not at all. All our houses are around a golf course. I've got fairways at the bottom of my garden. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, and of course, you know, I have company as well as old Win Stanley who comes to see me. Odd chap, 
Not quite a gent, I don't think. He leaves his bicycle in my garden shed because he's a member of the club and doesn't want to be seen cycling to the golf club. And he leaves his bicycle in my garden shed. In return, he digs my garden for me and we play a bit of chess occasionally and talk. So I've, I've, I've got company, you know. Then one evening, one evening I was visited by the Honsec of the golf club, who was old Colonel Spencer. He said, Sandy, old man, I'm in a spot of trouble at the golf club. I want you to do one last job for me. He said, we've got a tea thief in the club. <laughs> Members are losing their teas by the dozen. Could you come back into the old game, Sandy, and trace him for us? Willingly, I said. <laughs> the next time my old friend Win Stanley came round for a game of chess and uh, put his bike into my garden shed so he'd go and play golf, I said, Win Stanley, be my Watson on this. I want you to help me catch this chap who's thieving these teas from the golf club. He said, right oh, right oh, I'll be only too glad to help him return for your hospitality. So that night, we went out, I took a dark lantern, well, actually, it's a torch with a bulb had gone, and we went out. <laughs> and I posted, I posted Wynne Stanley inside the clubhouse, and I took a trick outside. Well, that night, 40 golf tees were missing from inside the clubhouse. So the following night, I put myself inside the clubhouse and told Wynne Stanley to patrol outside. No tees were missing from inside the golf club, but 31 were missing from golf bags left outside. <laughs> the following evening, I gave old Win Stanley off because he was looking a bit peaky, and I kept guard myself, and no golf tees were missing that night. Following day, I wrote the facts out on paper, and I thought, there must be a clue here. <laughs> <laughs> and suddenly, like a blinding revelation, the truth dawned. The thief wasn't me. <laughs> so the following night, I told Win Stanley to take a roving commission and just walk around where he liked, and I put bait out. I got a very bright red tea, fastened cotton to it, paid out the cotton and crouched behind the garden fence. After a while, I felt a tug on the line. I switched on my torch. I put a new bulb in. I shone it, and there was... Win Stanley, with a handful of golf tees, pushing them into the earth at six-inch intervals. I shouted, Ho there, the jig is up, Win Stanley. <laughs> Immediately the fellow cracked. Don't give me away, he sobbed. I said, you villain, you're a disgrace to the brigade. He said, I wasn't in your brigade, I was in the National Fire Service. <laughs> I said, then you're a disgrace to the fire brigade, man. Why, why, why? He said, I'll tell you. He said, I'm nothing, sir. I'm a member of the golf club. I haven't, got a, I haven't even got a car to go there. Nobody will talk to me. They say, what do you do, old man? And I say, I used to be a dental mechanic. <laughs> now, when they ask me what I am, I can say, I'm a retired tea planter. <laughs> <laughs> so I, looked, I, looked, I looked at the poor fellow, and I said, oh, very well, I, I won't report you. You realise that you've, you've broken any confidence between us. You, I can no longer offer you hospitality. I'm afraid our, our comradeship is over. He said, sir, sir, you don't mean... And I had to say it, an almost biblical sentence to pronounce on the chap. And my voice croaked like a raven. I said, yes, take thy bike from out of my hut. <laughs> By your vote, Frank Muir wins the contest of the two stories, and he and Dillis Powell win the entire contest by two marks. And that brings to an end this edition of My Word. In My Word, you heard Dillis Powell, Anne Scott James, Frank Muir, and Dennis Norton introduced by Jack Longland. 
The programme was devised by Tony Shryan and Edward J. Mason and presented by the BBC. BBC presents My Word. And here to introduce the programme and the panel is Jack Longland. My Word is a word game played by people whose business is words. And this programme comes to you from the Commonwealth Institute in London. Those taking part are Dillis Powell, Dennis Norton, Anne Scott James and Frank Muir. <laughs> Round one tries to test their respective vocabularies. Two marks if they get the meaning of these words right. We begin with Dillis Power. Dillis, what is agoraphobia? Agoraphobia means a fear of spaces. Uh, Large open. spaces, wide, that'll open. Do, that'll do. Open. Yes. Open. Yes, open spaces. And how does it come to have that meaning? Well, phobia means fear, and agora means um, a market or a... Cloud field. Cloud field, <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. Agora A sort of large... Yes, <laughs> 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 two marks. Two marks. <laughs> trapped in, it could be trapped in a rather large market. That's it. <laughs> and it comes from two Greek words, one meaning fear of, and the other meaning marketplace or place of public assembly, that you were terrified to leave your house and go out into this wide open space. Two marks. I, I have super agoraphobia. <laughs> and, uh, I have a morbid fear of supermarkets. <laughs> <laughs> Italian or <laughs> <laughs> Now, Dennis Norton, what is a salt lick? Actually, it, it's... Um, what you get from a dog if he's been at the peanuts. <laughs> um, are you, in Africa, is it something in Africa the animals go to a salt lick? Yes, they do. Yes, they do. <laughs> yes, they do. <laughs> yes, they do. <laughs> <laughs> Why? <laughs> For the salt, I would venture. I would I've hazard. seen them. That's absolutely, absolutely right. It really is. <laughs> I think that's near enough. It's a place, a salt lick, where animals collect to lick normally, earth impregnated with salt. If they can't get it from the earth, then uh, in certain countries at any rate, the farmers and others put down substance, usually rock salt, manufactured, because they do, as we do, they need a certain amount of salt with their dirt, which they can't always get. Two marks. Anne Scott James, what's the meaning of leaf? L-I-E-F, leaf. Um, I would as leaf be dead as marry young rascal varlet. Yes, meaning? Um, I would assume, I would, uh, means to like a thing, to love a thing, to be willing. Yes, it'll do. Two marks. Um, leaf means gladly or willingly, and Anne's example was a very good one, and originally an adjective, I, I should find it as pleasant to do so-and-so um, as something quite impossible. Okay. Frank Muir, what is a cantaloupe? A species of melon. Yes. Can you describe it more accurately? From the continent. Yes. Which, um, uh, being a, a Catholic community, uh, the melon has always been featured in the wedding breakfast, uh, uh, signifying that um, in the Catholic country, um, permission is needed from parents, and it has to be a church wedding, and a young couple can't elope. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, despite the entire irrelevance of the latter part of that answer, I think he gets his two marks. <laughs> it's a kind of small, round, ribbed melon, which comes from, originally came from a place called Cantalupo in Italy, and here, Frank, is a bit more relevant, because Cantalupo was a former country seat of the Pope. Yeah. Well, before we start round two, I give each team a quotation for them to write down, and I want the two women members of the teams to go on studying those quotations, because at the end of the program, I shall ask them where the quotations came from. Dillis Powell and Frank Muir, your quotation is, she wheels her wheelbarrow through streets broad and narrow, crying cockles and mussels, alive, alive, oh. And then after that long one, and Scott James and Dennis, yours is, so shines a good deed in a naughty world. And at the end of the program, I shall ask Frank and Dennis to give me their idea of how these came to be said or written. <laughs> Round two is a round of odds and ends. Two marks for correct answers. Dennis Powell, what is or was the Salic or Salic law? It was a Roman law. You mustn't no, have a salt without about... permission. <laughs> <laughs> it was about uh, the scent through the woman. Yes, and meaning for or against. Which was the it? What? Which was it? Think of Henry V. Which part? <laughs> <laughs> Above or below the belt. <laughs> yeah. Oh dear, which was it? You couldn't, you couldn't, the woman couldn't inherit. That's it. Um, Salic law was a law which excludes women from succeeding to the throne, and it was a so called fundamental law of the French monarchy, which the English disputed, and it, among other things, led up to the Hundred Years' War. Um, and the idea was that you couldn't let women succeed because there were certain military duties attached to the holding of lands, and they weren't supposed to be quite so good at that as the men. Two marks. Dennis Norton, what's the difference between cursive writing and uncial writing? Vital, the difference. <laughs> <laughs> um, cursive writing is what we used to call when I was at school joining up writing. Yes? You used to have to write letters to your relations in your best joining up writing. <laughs> That's cursive, right? What was the other one? Uncil. U N C I A L. No, the difference is that that isn't joining up writing. <laughs> uh, I remember, Dennis, Jack, Dennis, you asked for the difference. Yes, you're, you're right. And you're you're dead difference. right. <laughs> Whether you could <laughs> venture to describe it a little more positively, I don't know. You asked, now, well, now we're into overtime. So. <laughs> one and a half, I think, Dennis. And, and Dennis Norton was absolutely right about cursive writing. Uncial is the opposite, where the letters are printed and separate, usually in capitals, and it stems from manuscripts in the early 4th to 8th centuries. It literally means an inch high. In other words, it was very, very much larger than the little <laughs> running writing, cursive. And Scott James, who wrote Tess of the D'Urbervilles, and how did Tess die? Well, it was written by Thomas Hardy, and she died on the gallows. Yeah. No, she was captured by the police in Salisbury Plain and she was condemned to um, hang. All right, that's good enough, though. Two marks. Thomas Hardy wrote it. She was hanged for the murder of Alec Durberville, or Derbyfield, who had wrecked poor Tessie's life. Uh, Frank Muir, the meaning of the word and um, origin to precocious. Precocious. Uh, the meaning is uh, uh, mature before one's time. Yes. And it comes, uh, it's sort of pre-Old Testament, uh, when the, uh, before the Jewish tribes had kosher foods. <laughs> um, the, food, the food clue is right, Frank, you're getting very close. The food clue is right. <laughs> Something to do with food, precocious, yeah. pre-cooked. Yes. Um, precocious nowadays... <laughs> precocious nowadays means somebody who is prematurely developed either mentally or in one or more of his faculties and it does come from these two quite simple words um, pre-cooking cooking beforehand prepared in advance or prepared prematurely Frank got it absolutely right well now a round of sentences in which one pretty difficult or unusual word gives the general meaning two marks if you can explain what's happening in these situations Dennis Powell the famous pop star ran his fingers through his long, greasy hair and his manager grunted disapprovingly, you've got a lot too much hair, he commented. 
In fact, you've got the longest hair of any man I know. The pop star smirked loftily. You should see my guru, he replied. Guru. G-U-R-U. Guru is a, is a, is a kind of Indian, um, a rather holy advisor. And what do you look like? Okay. Long hair. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, a guru is an Indian or Hindu spiritual teacher, and he also tends to have long hair. Dennis Norden, the bold explorer found out the hard way that the hostile natives had, since his last visit, exchanged their pangas for brownings. Pangas were a kind of, of um, sword, and they'd exchanged these swords for copies of the Pied Piper of Hamlin. <laughs> um, and all the go had gone out of them. Um, all the fight had left them. <laughs> the story's the wrong way round, I read, Dennis. <laughs> they were getting more efficient, rather than less. Oh, then it's browning guns of some Yes. Kind. And a panga, not so much a sword... Sort of scimitar, isn't it? Isn't it a not that's getting narrow, really. I don't know. A panga <laughs> is a broad, heavy knife, like a machete. And a browning is a kind of automatic rifle. I believe it also can be a, a kind of pistol. And Scott James... When asked if his visit abroad had been fruitful, the prince replied, yes, the current sultana is a peach. <laughs> peach? Is that the one you're asking me? Uh, yes. The current? Yeah. <laughs> the sultana is the wife of the sultan. Yes, that'll do. Um, the phrase, yes, the current sultana is a peach, meant that the present sultan's wife, or in fact mother or daughter, as the case might be, was pretty dishy. Too much. <laughs> <laughs> now, Frank, now, although the young lady was wearing a topless bikini, she behaved with frontless composure. Ah. <laughs> frontless. It's kind of uh, um, attitude of behaviour without an artificial facade erected of it, good manners. You're getting quite near it. Effrontery, it's the yes, same, same sort of word. Same word as effrontery. All right, one and a half. I help Unblushing. You. That's it, I'll give you two, because that's exactly <laughs> the word I wanted. <laughs> uh, frontless in the 18th century, and I believe it could be used now, means um, unblushing or audacious or shameless. Now we come to the last round and go back to those quotations I gave the two teams early in the programme. For two marks, Dillis Powell, can you give me the origin of your quotation? She wheels her wheelbarrow through streets broad and narrow, crying cockles and mussels, alive, alive, oh. It's an Irish song. Where would you be likely to find it? Or In who Dublin. <laughs> who wrote it? And the faintest idea. One out of two. <laughs> uh, the song Cockles and Mussels was, I think, oh, first... One out of two? <laughs> two out of two. Um, I wanted to know where it came from. Dublin. Which is Dublin. the Dublin? No, the Oxford Songbook was what I really wanted. <laughs> 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 as far as I know, the first time it was printed was in the Oxford Songbook. It's a very, very <laughs> affecting song in which, in the end, the ghost of sweet Molly Malone wheels the barrow. Now, Anne Scott James, the origin of your quotation, please. So shines a good deed in a naughty world. Shakespeare. Yes. Shakespeare. Well, and I'd like to know play and speaker and those well, other Well, I things. think it's in The Merchant of Venice. Yes, quite right. Do you remember Why who spoke I... it? Why, um, try Porsche. Yes, you're absolutely right. You get your two marks well done. <laughs> well, now I'm going to ask Frank and Dennis to tell me their explanation of how these quotations came into being. And on this occasion, the marks will go to whichever incredible explanation receives the longer applause from the audience here in the mm. theatre. So back to Frank Muir and his quotation... She wheels her wheelbarrow through streets broad and narrow, crying cockles and mussels, alive, alive, oh. A week ago, in the Charing Cross Hotel, underneath one of the central tables in the dining room, on the grey carpet, I brought a new meaning into the life of Mrs. Bassington Leatherbarrow. What was I doing under the table with Mrs. <laughs> Bassington Leatherbarrow? I hear you asking. <laughs> well, well, you see, I was there because of the soup. I'd retired under the table for reasons which will emerge later. I was sitting under the table, which was quite comfortable, rather like being in a sort of 
white square igloo. <laughs> and I was joined after about seven minutes by this rather mauve-faced lady. And she lifted one side of my square white igloo and said, excuse me, my name is Mrs. Bassington Leatherbow, and I was wondering what you're doing sitting under the table. So I said, well, it's because of the soup. And she sat down beside me. <laughs> for a while, each waited for the other to speak. Eventually, I said, well, I've had rather an awful day. Yesterday, whilst driving home in my brand new car, um, one of the pedals fell off. <laughs> and um, I was left with a very sharp spike. And it was a clutch, which has an awfully strong spring. And it bore through the sole of my shoe. And I had a very painful journey. And in order to come back to London, to the garage, to report this, I couldn't drive the car. I had a hole in my shoe, and I had to take the train. And eventually, I went to the garage and said the clutch pedal fell off. And the man said, well, it's a new car, teething troubles, you know, <laughs> sir. So I said, well, I'm, I'm terribly sorry to have bothered you. Thank you for giving me your time. So I went back to catch the, the train home, and I went for a, a, a quick wash beforehand um, downstairs, you know, at, at um, Charing Cross, and they had one of those roller towels on the wall. And my hands were all wet, and the chap before me, I think, was a sweep who just had a quick clean-up <laughs> before catching home. So I zunked it down, and it zunked down five inches. Now, I'd washed my face as well, and I had all that smelly soft soap all over my chin, and the clean bit only extended to my forehead. And it was one of those very slow time bombs inside the thing, which went ticka, 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 ticka. And it was about another three minutes before I could zonk it down another five inches. And it took me three zonks to get to my chin. And I lost my train. So having lost my train, I went to the hotel to have some food. And I was sitting there, and the soup came, and it was celery soup, and it was much too salty. And I said to the waiter, the celery soup's too salty. And he said, we've had no other complaints. <laughs> so I thought, if I sat under the table, if I crept under the table when he wasn't looking, eventually he'd think I'd gone away and would remove the soup. So I explained all this, and she said, you are awful, you're spineless, you men. You just will not complain. I said, one can't make a scene. She said, I would. She said, let me, let me go around these places for you and complain for you. I said, do you really want to? She said, yes. And suddenly a blinding thought struck me. Eureka, I said. She said, isn't that Eureka? I said, I was thinking of Beethoven. <laughs> and, and I stood up and I said, now, what we can do? And suddenly a blinding headache came over me and I couldn't think for a moment. And she said, you've got the table on your head. <laughs> and I lifted the table down. I said, now, look, why don't we set up a service where you complain for people like me? And when something goes wrong, instead of just knuckling under, uh, we send you up. We'll call it Winter Mrs. Barrington Leatherbow. <laughs> and I'll give you an armband. She had a very thick arm. It would go right <laughs> round quite comfortably. And you could be the first armbands woman. And we, could, <laughs> and we could broadcast it, and I'll say something on my word to the whole nation that if you get into trouble, if the laundry sends things back with no buttons, and if the back end of your car falls off, don't just knuckle under. Use our Ringer Mrs. Barrington leather barrel service. She loves any kind of mess up. She loves it when you order the wrong thing. So do use our service. And in the words of the song, she wheels her wheel power through things bought in error, crying cock-ups and mess-ups. I love, I love all. <laughs>most considerable service to the British male since Waterloo. <laughs> and we go on to Dennis Norden's quotation, which, if you'll remember, was, so shines a good deed in a naughty world. I always feel a bit embarrassed when that chap 
who sits in the middle, uh, always announces this programme as being played by people whose business is words. Because it isn't wholly true in my case, because I have this small dry cleaning establishment where <laughs> I get most of the income. And also because I have a friend whose business really is words. He's a tattooist, <laughs> a professional tattooist. And his business is words because he charges so much a word. One chap he had who was very stingy and he wanted the word mother tattooed on him, but not across his chest. <laughs> he wanted it tattooed across his abdomen. You see, he was so penny-pinching, he wanted to save on the letter O. <laughs> um, but the, the strangest customer my friend the tattooist ever had was yesterday. So strange indeed that my friend came round to me last night to tell me about him and to ask me for help. He said, this man came into the shop. He's called Albert. A little man he was. And he said to me, I want a tattoo, please. And my friend said, yes, sir. And he reached for the designs of the butterflies and the entwined heart and the flags of all nations. And the man said, no, no, I don't want pictures. I want just a word. One word. And my friend said, well, let me guess. Mother, Gladys, Excelsior. <laughs> and the man said, no. The word I want is shorter than all of those. Four letters. <laughs> and he told him, which one? <laughs> and he said, I can't tattoo that. Albert said, I will pay handsomely. I've been saving up a long time for this. I want it right across my forehead. <laughs> well, my friend was past shock by now, so he did it. He didn't say another word until the Albert was just leaving. My friend just summed up enough control to say, why? And the man said, I have my reasons. And then he left. And that was why my friend, the tattooist, came round to me last night and told me the story. And he said, there. He said, you're a writer. Why would a man want to walk around for the rest of his life with that word indelibly inscribed across his forehead? Well, you won't believe this. I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> and for some strange reason, I've been thinking about it all day. And I still don't know. I've got theories. I had an idea it might be the registration number of his car. <laughs> but it isn't, because I rang up the Ministry of Transport. <laughs> that was an interesting conversation. Too, <laughs> um, then I had a theory it might be a form of social protest. You know, all those forms that we have to fill up these days, you know, for everything, and they say, what is your age, your height, any distinguishing characteristics? <laughs> <laughs> what a pleasure it would be to write. <laughs> now, I don't know the reason for this, but I promise you something. I'm going to find out. And I'll find out by next week, and I'll report back. It will be my good deed for the week. Or as Shakespeare said, so shines a good deed in a naughty word. <laughs> Well, I
think by your applause, Frank Muir just wins the contest of two stories. <laughs> but nevertheless, the entire contest is won by Anne Scott James and Dennis Norton. And that brings to an end this edition of My Word. In My Word, you heard Dillis Powell, Anne Scott James, Frank Muir and Dennis Norton, introduced by Jack Longland. The programme was devised by Tony Schreien and Edward J. Mason and presented by the BBC. BBC presents My Word. And here to introduce the programme and the panel is Jack Longland. My Word is a word game played by people whose business is words, and this programme comes to you from the Commonwealth Institute in London. And those taking part are Anne Scott James, Frank Muir, Dillis Powell, and Dennis Norton. <laughs> Round one tries to test their respective vocabularies. Two marks if they get the meaning of these words right. And Scott James, what is the meaning of dander? D-A-N-D-E-R. It's a dashing sort of gander. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's a noun, but not that kind. A cross gander. Yes, that's much better. Oh, it's an um, it's a noun, a dander, a rage, a fury. Yes, absolutely right. Temper, anger, rage, indignation. To get your dander up means to make somebody angry or to grow angry yourself. Frank Miller, what is the pam? P a m. The pam. Pam. Chinese map. <laughs> <laughs> Splendid idea. It's a girl. No, not the... I know about five girls, and two of them are called Pam. Um, this is a game of chance. Ah, uh, it's a card game. Yeah? And, uh, and <laughs> Pam is when you say, Pam! And that, it's French. <laughs> yeah? No. It is a particular card, but have a shot at it. The card? Mm -hmm. Oh, it's the Seven of Diamonds. <laughs> <laughs> um, it is the Knave of Clubs. Oh, Especially he. when you're playing five card loo. If you do. <laughs> or <you>? solitaire. <laughs> <laughs> the Dillis Bow. What is permafrost? P E R M A F R O S T, one word. Permafrost. It's frost which goes on all the year, as in this country. <laughs> nice thought. Um, You've got to get a bit further north. Have I? Mm -hmm. Oh, it's in Iceland or regions <laughs> further north. <laughs> and what, you haven't said yet what it is. It's frost. It's the permanently frozen subsoil that you get in Arctic regions like Alaska and um, Yukon and edges of Greenland and so on. It never completely unfreezes the ground down to quite considerable depth. Now, Dennis Norton. Dennis, what is guddling? G U double D L I N G, guddling. Well, guddling, Jack, is sort of, um, it's a type of simultaneous um, guzzling and cuddling. <laughs> so, yeah, it's a form of, of snogging, which is known as making a meal of it. <laughs> um, 
But I must say, I like your explanation far better than the real one, <laughs> Dennis. It's catching fish with the hands by groping about under the stones or banks of a stream, rather like tickling the trout. Well, before we begin round two, I give each team a quotation for them to write down, and I hope that the women members of the team will go on studying the quotations, because at the end of the programme, I shall ask where those quotations come from. Anne Scott James and Dennis Norden, your quotation is not a translation, only taken from the French. And Dillis Powell and Frank, yours is my little grey home in the West. And then at the end of the programme, I shall ask Dennis and Frank to give me their ideas of how these came to be said or written. Now, round two is, well, a bit fruity too. Fruity answers to some apple questions is what we need. Two marks for correct or reasonably correct answers. And Scott James, what does the expression apple polishing mean? It means sucking up to the boss. Yes. Now, why? <laughs> Absolutely right. I thought I was being terribly funny. <laughs> <laughs> Why? It's, oh, uh, come on, Dennis. It's trans I, I've only heard it actually in American political writing. Yes. And I think it's got to do with taking an apple for the teacher and then polishing it for her or something like that. Well done. Just the ultimate in sort of bootlicking mm. and let's put mm. under and I won't show but that. It's, it's American, I'm sure. Yes, it, it is. Between you, you're absolutely dead right. This is what it is. Two marks. Um, Frank Muir, what briefly was the story of Newton and the apple and how did we come to learn of it? Well, the story, bracket briefly, end of bracket, is that he was dozing in an orchard and an apple fell on his nut. <laughs> and pondering the incident, he concluded that uh, it was some force which brought it down, yeah. uh, the physical force of gravity. Yes, quite right. In fact, it wasn't an apple at all. It was an elderly lady <laughs> <laughs> up in the tree called Granny Smith. <laughs> She's been putting it around every <laughs> I'm going to give you one and a half for that and Granny really Smith, but in fact, although Frank's description was perfectly accurate, he saw or felt an apple fall from a tree, Isaac Newton, and this led on, after quite a long time, I think about 19 years, to the <laughs> law of gravitation. Um, but in fact, there was a niece of his called Mrs. Cundit, who told the French writer Voltaire what had happened, because it had happened when... Newton was in the garden of his mother's house at Woolsthorpe, and it was Voltaire who spread the story round. Yeah. In oh. French, too. In French, too, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One and a half. Voltaire. Now, Dillis Powell, what were the apples of Sodom? Of Sodom? Mm hmm. Dead sea fruit. Yes. <laughs> well done. <laughs> and what were they? Uh, dead sea fruit. Um, not seaweed. Ah. Did see fruit. Um, it looked nice, but. Oh, not that horrible. Mm. Salt. Thorn apple, thorn apple. Yes, you're getting near it. Um, I one. think, again, one and a half. Um, Dead sea fruit is, should be anything which looks appetizing, but proves frightfully disappointing when you try it, uh, either literally or figuratively. And uh, the quotation which bears on this is, there are apple trees on the sides of the Dead Sea which bear lovely fruit, but inside are full of ashes. And Sodom and Gomorrah were the two cities of the plain which the Dead Sea, I think, in the end swallowed up. One half. Dennis Norton, what is apple jack? Apple jack is a kind of, um, it's a drink. Yes. Um, it's an alcoholic American drink. It's... Uh, Kind of Van du Pay of the Beverly Hillbillies. <laughs> um, that's all I know about it. They they drink it out of sort of jugs rather than glasses or. Yes, um, Dennis, uh, uh, as it were, a wine or a spirit? I think it's a spirit. Yes, that's right. Absolutely. Two marks it is. In the United States, this, this is the drink they distill from fermented apple juice. It's just like French Calvados. Um, it is used sometimes. This phrase in this country, in East Anglia. An apple jack is sometimes there, an apple turnover, which is quite different. In this round, the compiler, who's run out of real verse and poetry, has made up some questions in verse, or what he calls doggerel. The answer to these questions lies in the last line of the verse, and he challenges members of the two teams to give this last line. 
two marks for reasonable answers. Anne Scott James, author and title in the last line, first a novel, then a film, now a film in which they sing. It would appear the British people do like chips with everything. The author and title will come tripping off your lips. <laughs> James Hilton and the book. Goodbye, Mr. Chips. <laughs> That'll do. I'm sorry, I've got the meter wrong. No, all right. One. James Hilton wrote the novel. It was Goodbye, Mr. Chips. Quite right. Two marks. Frank Muir, novelist first and book then in your last line. Up in a garret away from the smell, writing and writing sits poor Ellis Bell. But what is her real name and what is it she writes? Charlotte Bonte in Wuthering Heights. All right, except for the Christian name. You've got... Oh, yes. <laughs> um, uh, Birmingham Heights. <laughs> <laughs> Emily Bronte and Wuthering Heights. All right. Says Dewis. <laughs> the three Bronte sisters wrote under pseudonyms um, of Acton, Curra, and Ellis Bell. Dennis Powell, in this verse, we want a last line giving the title of the book <coughs> and the author in that order. The hero of this novel with the villain had a tiff and found himself imprisoned in the bowels of Chateau Diff, <laughs> a novel full of action but a little short on humour. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexander Dumas. It's old Alexander Dumas or Alexander Dumas Père yeah. or whatever you call him. <laughs> Too much. Well done. Dennis Norton, two book titles in your last line. James Augustine Aloysius, Irish, surnamed Joyce wrote important books that weren't quite everybody's choice. Two now, in particular, some people couldn't take. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexander Dumas. Finnegan's Wake. One was called Ulysses and the other Finnegan's Wake. Well done. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> two marks it is. Well, now a round of odds and ends. Two marks again. And Scott James, where does the expression drunk as a helot come from? Why helots and why drunk? Well, the helots were the slaves in Sparta. Yes. I wouldn't have thought the Spartans would have let them get at the bottle myself because they kept them very much <coughs> under the heel. Only for a rather odd reason. I should think because they were going to push them into a particularly sticky battle and they couldn't make them fight unless they got them plastered first. Um, and Scott James is quite right in saying that Helots were the serfs, I think, rather than actual slaves in ancient Sparta, and it therefore means somebody of rather base standing, menial standing. Uh, but they used to make them drunk quite deliberately to act as an object lesson to the real noble Spartan youths so that they learnt to avoid drunkenness. Frank Muir, what is or was a groaning chair? Or a groaning chair? A groaning chair? Yes was a chair that you sat in and groaned. <laughs> yes, in, in a sense that I think is true, but it, it, it had a rather particular connotation. It's, uh, it was a special chair where people were sat. Yes? When they had some kind of complaint to make. I, I can't go further than that. Um, I think that's quite a good shot, one out of two. It's quite early, actually. Yes, it's an old and sort of rustic name for a chair in which a woman sat after her confinement I well, didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> to receive congratulations on the baby and all sorts of other things. They, they had groaning cake and groaning cheese and a very strong ale indeed called groaning malt. And these were all served as well while she sat in the chair and presumably groaned. Saying, <laughs> <laughs> saying never, never again. again. Never again. <laughs> <laughs> One out of two. Dennis Powell, what is an augury? And why is it so called? A U G U R Y, augury. Well, it means a, 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 a sort of, um, not exactly a prophecy, but um, something which happens which uh, bodes mm. well. Oh, it, yes, it can bode. Bodes right? well or bodes ill. Mm -hmm. Bodes well or ill. And how does it come to mean that? Uh, something to do with the Latin. Yeah. An augur yeah. uh, was a character who I think. Um, did he read the entrails of animals? He did, among other things, yes. Well, then, he read the entrails of animals. He read the entrails of animals <laughs> mm. in order to, to prophesy, to say what's going to happen next. Jolly good. Mm. Two marks it is. Uh, it means, roughly, prophesying what's going to happen. 
and the auger was a, an official, he was a real sort of civil servant. His job was to foretell the future, sometimes from the entrails of birds, if they were all twisted up and wrong and he didn't go out for a picnic, but, or from what they were doing in the sky. He used to stand on a big hill in Rome, the Capitoline, and divide the heavens in half with his wand. Anything on the left-hand side flying in, that was jolly unlucky. Anything on the right-hand side flying in or out was jolly lucky. And you did, took action accordingly. He did his best according to his lights. <laughs> 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 well, then, Dennis Norden, what's the difference between a layman and a lay figure? Well, a layman is um, a non expert. Uh, mm -hmm. Dor Dorothy Parker once reviewed a book and she said he has explained um, economics so as to make it comprehensible to the laity. To which you will reply, that is no laity, that's my wife. <laughs> um, that's a layman. And a lay figure is like a, it's like a dummy. It's yeah. a dummy figure, like, like in a um, um, shop window. Yes, it, it was a particular kind of dummy, but... Uh, artist dummy. Yes, artist dummy. Yeah. All right, good enough. Two marks it is. Now we come to the last round and go back to those quotations I gave the teams earlier in the programme. For two marks, Anne, Anne Scott James, can you give me the origin of your quotation? Not a translation, only taken from the French. Can you give me an idea? Oh, well, 18th century. I was just going to say that. Um, <laughs> it's about a play. Mm. Oh, so many 18th century. I know, it's terrible. Have a shot at the author. The Rivals. Yeah, hey, well, have to, uh, give me the author and I'll give you a mark. I can't. <laughs> oh, the Rivals. Oh, the author's the Rivals. Yes. <laughs> Shelley. All right, it's uh, not a translation, only taken from the French. It comes from <coughs> Act One, Scene One, of The Critic by <coughs> Sheridan. As far as I remember, I'm not quite certain about this. It was spoken by Mr. Puff. Now, Dillis Powell, I'd like the origin of your quotation, My Little Grey Home in the West. It's a, it was a song very popular before any of you were born in the First World War. Dillis is quite right. It was a First World War song and written by a man with the name D. Erdley Wilmot. Now back to uh, Dennis Norden and his quotation, not a translation, only taken from the French. Well, last week I brought to your attention a problem which happened to be preying on my mind at the time. It concerned a friend of mine who was a tattooist who had been visited by a little insignificant man called Albert. And Albert had asked him to tattoo something on his forehead. When I say something, I mean a word. And when I say a word, I mean a four-letter word. <laughs> and when I say a four-letter word, I mean... Well, anyway, I, <coughs> <coughs> I ask, I put the problem to you, is why should this man, Albert, want to walk around for the rest of his life with this particularly colourful word emblazoned above his eyebrows. <laughs> and I asked if any of you could offer any possible explanations or suggestions. Well, I had a most fantastic response. <laughs> 700 letters. <laughs> now, disregarding 600 of them, who just wrote to know what was the word. <laughs> <laughs> The rest were extremely ingenious. And the first letter here, we'll pick them up round, Mrs. from Mrs. L.B. of Devizes. Dear Mr. Norden, after listening to your programme tonight, my four-year-old daughter took her box of crayons and disappeared into her bedroom. When she returned, she had a word printed right across her little forehead, and I'm sure she never heard it in this house. <laughs> It goes on, I think you are an irresponsible lout who ought to be publicly flogged and then deported back to wherever you... Well, I don't think there's much point in reading <laughs> the rest of this one because it's just the usual fan letter stuff. <laughs> oh, now, this is a much more likely one. Um, Dear Mr. Norton, as a publisher and distributor of modern American novels, I have often wished to do what Albert did. 
I could then go round to the Director of Public Prosecution, shove my face across his desk and say, all right, mate, confiscate that. <laughs> well, now, I think we are getting near to the root of what made Albert... Do, wait a minute, there's another one here. Dear Mr Norton, I see Albert as a kind of Graham Greene character. I think he is a scoutmaster who has lost his sense of vocation, but still cannot utterly discard his past. The purpose of the tattoo, therefore, is that now, when he finds himself in a situation which tests his vow to be clean in thought, word and deed, that is to say, suppose someone in a chip shop unexpectedly spills hot fat over his foot, he need not break that vow by uttering anything. All he needs to do is raise his hat. <laughs> Well, I, I would be prepared to be convinced by that, and I don't think we need read any... Oh, now, wait a minute. <laughs> wait a minute. Wait a minute, listen to this. Dear Mr Norden, I am Albert. <laughs> you want to know why I had that word tattooed across my forehead? All right, I'll tell you. That's why I did it. Yours sincerely, Albert. Well, isn't it funny how when a thing is explained to you, it becomes so obvious and you wonder why you never thought of it before. <laughs> I'll tell you what the reason was, actually. Though, uh, it, it really isn't very interesting. In fact, it's rather trivial. You see, Albert always wanted to have a fringe and his wife would never let him. See? Well, now... <laughs> She's got no option. <laughs> I told you it was trivial, didn't I? It's a disappointment when you come to it. It's, it's like Sheridan said. It's not a sensation, only taken from the fringe. <laughs> Dennis Norton has the most interesting correspondence. Um, now, back to Frank Muir, and if you remember, his quotation was, my little grey home in the West. Yes, ah, ha. Yes, well, I, I, I hadn't got a story this week. There wasn't any point at all in me attempting one, because um, I know that if I told a story, it wouldn't win the contest. So, a few minutes in hand, a song. <laughs> Never swat a fly, he may love another fly, he may sit with her and sigh the way I do with you. <laughs> You've got to take note of signs, you know, in life. You can't, uh, you can't ignore them. I'm not superstitious, but these signs are important when you're told things. For instance, I was foolish enough to ignore all the signs, and I got married. <laughs> when there was an hour in the month on a Friday well of course it was ludicrous and what happened the rather inexpensive marquee we had the reception in collapsed on us <laughs> it wasn't an accident it was a poor tent <laughs> <laughs> never kill a moth when he goes flying through the air he may have a date in someone's flannel underwear <laughs> Billy me. It all started last night with me, you see. You see, last night I didn't, obviously, nor did any of us, I didn't want to see the full moon through glass. So naturally I slept at the bottom of the bed with my feet on the pillow. Because when I woke up this morning to go to the bathroom, I fell out of the window. <laughs> this, this rather upset me, because then, trying to get in through the front door in my pyjamas, I saw myself in glass before touching a brown dog. <laughs> so I was in dead trouble. So of course I did all, all, all that any of us could do under the circumstances. I dressed with my eyes closed, standing on my right foot. <laughs> well, at lunchtime today, just after lunch, I didn't like the sausages, so to save myself being poisoned, I reached my hand inside my shirt. Because you know the old saying, um, turn your hair's foot twice, then twice, if the bangers don't taste nice. <laughs> and reaching in, I suddenly saw what I was wearing, because I put the clothes on in the dark, 
and I put on a filthy old string vest, <laughs> terribly old and grey. I then knew I was done for. I was finished. Because you know, you know the saying, which you cannot buck. If you wear grey next to your skin, the my word story, you won't win. <laughs> so I knew that today I'd had it, and there was absolutely no point in telling the story. Because uh, I won't win. I was told I won't win. And what told me? My little grey omen, the vest. <laughs> I think by your applause, Frank Muir just wins the contest of two stories, <laughs> and he and uh, Phyllis Powell also win by one mark, and that brings to an end this edition of My Word. In My Word, you heard Dillis Powell, Anne Scott James, Frank Muir, and Dennis Norton, introduced by Jack Longland. The programme was devised by Tony Shryan and Edward J. Mason and presented by the BBC. BBC presents My Word. And here to introduce the programme and the panel is Jack Longland. My Word is a word game played by people whose business is words. Those taking part are Dillis Powell, Dennis Norden, Anne Scott James and Frank Muir. Here's round one, which tries to test their respective vocabularies. Two marks if they get the meaning of these words right. We begin with Dillis Powell. Dillis, what is a throw? T-H-R-O-E, throw. Well, it's a rather uncomfortable uh, situation. One is in the throes of composition or acrobatics <laughs> or... Um, Still, it's literally, I mean, you've given the figurative meaning of it, and, um, the difficulties of literary composition, but absolutely literally, what's it mean? In the, in the disagreeable grip of. Yes, you just creep home, I think, but only just, with two marks. That's all right. Uh, literally, it means a violent pang or spasm, for instance, the throes of childbirth, or uh, figuratively, in the throes of spring cleaning, or something equally unpleasant. <laughs> Is that why they say a horse has thrown a colt? It probably is, Frank. I never well, thought of that, but I think it probably is. Well. Look it up. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're very likely right. Two marks. Dennis Norton, define the word margravine. M-A-R-G-R-A-V-I-N-E, or if you prefer it, margravine. Well, a margravine is a ravine which somebody has filled with margarine. <laughs> <laughs> now... Obviously, that raises the big question, why should anyone <laughs> want to fill a ravine with margarine? And, of course, the answer is because it's cheaper than butter. <laughs> <laughs> Bach wrote the Brandenburg Concerto yes. for the Margrave of Brandenburg, That's it. That's it. and I imagine his wife would have been the Margravine. Yes. Um, Margravine, as you say quite right, is the wife of a Margrave, <laughs> and it was given 
originally the title to the military governor of a border province. The point is the mark, which is the border. And these were uh, counts of the mark, and afterwards became, this was a title of the Holy Roman Empire. Now, Anne Scott James, what is collage? C-O-L-L-A-G-E. Oh, it's something artists do. Yes. Now, if an artist takes a photograph and he sort of mounts on top of that a three-dimensional plasticine thing of a donkey, and then he puts on that a very nice drawing of a rattle, he's made a collage. Yes, absolutely right. <laughs> Two marks it is. It's a form of art in which things like photographs and pieces of paper and matchsticks and all sorts of other things are glued together uh, close to each other on the pictorial surface. And I think it goes right back to Picasso and people like that. Frank Noah, what's the meaning of gaga? G-A-G-A. <laughs> gaga. <laughs> well, it was uh, is one of those novels, French novels at the turn of the century. There was Gigi and Nana and Gaga. <laughs> 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 also, in my part of the country, it's a... Uh, it's a word you use as somebody who is slightly non compost mentis. Yes. <laughs> yes, that's good enough. It's somebody a bit uh, doolally. <laughs> <laughs> Two marks it is. Gaga means senile, dotty, fatuous, simple, all those things. Well, before we begin round two, I give each team a quotation for them to write down, and the two women members of the teams will go on studying those quotations, because at the end of the programme I shall ask them where the quotations come from. And Dillis Powell and Frank Noah. Your quotation is, a thing of beauty is a joy forever. And Anne Scott James and Dennis, yours is, circumstances alter cases. And at the end of the programme, I shall ask Frank and Dennis to give me their idea of how these came to be said or written. Then we have a round of origins and derivations, and three marks this time, because I want members of the team to do two things. First of all, to define the present meaning and then give me the origin and derivation of these words or expressions or phrases. Dennis Powell, farthings and halfpennies. Well, a uh, halfpenny means half a penny. Yes. And a farthing means a fourth part, a yes. fourth part of yes. a penny. And how did it come to mean that? Well, they sort of cut the penny in quarters and halves. Yes, you're absolutely right. You'll get your three marks straight away. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Dennis Powell is quite right. Farthing means a fourth part, just as a halfpenny means what it says. And there was a time in Anglo-Saxon times when the penny was a silver coin which had a very deep cross across it, two ways, uh, rather like a hot cross bun, and you could break off the quarters, and each of those was then a farthing. Um, later on, they minted a, a silver farthing and a silver halfpenny, so you didn't have to keep on breaking up your coinage. But originally, that was what it was. Dennis Norton, a blot upon his escutcheon. Well, it means, it means something that brings disgrace to his name or his family name. Yes. And an escutcheon was a shield. And a shield that was very important, your family shield, sort of thing, with a crest. And it was very, because you used the shield for fighting and, and you brought home dead on it and mm. used it for serving drinks on and <laughs> put it upside down you can make a coffee table so it was very <laughs> important not to get all ink stains on it and they used to say never fill your fountain pen near your escutcheon <laughs> <laughs> so a blot on the escutcheon is somebody who's dirtied his shield <laughs> and was therefore known as a dirty knight <laughs> um, oh absolutely right and it's three marks straight away um, the shield had your armorial bearings on, if you deserve them, as a knight, and all the rest of Dennis said is absolutely right. It was a, something which you've done which let you down and let your good name down. And Scott James, to line someone's pocket or lining your pocket? Well, it means to turn a slightly dishonest penny. Yes, in... I mean, if you're in local government or something or other, <laughs> and you're getting a little bit on the side for selling the wrong field, then you're lining your pocket. Side. That's not libeling anybody. Yes, that's all right. Um, now, and, origin uh, thereof. And, uh, I mean, just quite simply, how did it come to mean this? Oh, you know, fine old Elizabethan phrase, if you were rich, you had not just a pocket but a lining to it. And the it was lined with what? Money. 
Cat fur. <laughs> that too, but Dennis has got it right. Cash. Money. Yes, yeah, it's not cash. That'd be very money, 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 money. Money, money. Yes, that's quite right. Uh, three marks it is. Lining your pocket is money usually placed, placed there as a bribe, and one example of it was when Beau Brummel was the arbiter of fashion, tailors needed his um, approval and his patronage, and the famous court tailor made him a dress coat and did literally line the pockets with banknotes, and Brummel thanked them for their work and for the style, but in particular for the linings that they'd put in. But it comes before Beau Brummel's time. Frank Muir, pot boilers. One word, pot boilers. Pot boilers uh, nowadays is a vaguely literary connotation, mm. and it means um, a piece of hack work you do just to pay the rent. Yeah. And in other words, there's no particular merit no. except that you uh, earn some money from it. And it comes to mean that from what? I mean, it's quite simple. Um, from um, boiling a pot. Um, <laughs> pot boiling presumably meant that um, I referred either to what was shooting something to put in the pot. Mm -hmm. or hewing wood in order to keep the pot boiling. Um, Frank's quite right. Either of those would do, I think, yes. All right, that's three marks. <coughs> now a round of sentences in which are included one or two unusual and difficult words, and these words give the meaning for the whole sentence. For two marks, please explain the following. Tillis Powell, with me, said the elephant apologetically to the camel, overindulgence in must always brings on must. Must? Must, M-U-S-T. Overindulgence in must always brings on must. Uh, must, I thought, was something to do with drink. Yes, that's right. That's, that's one thing. half the answer. Now, it brings on must. Must? It's a camel or an elephant talking, which they don't very often. <laughs> no, I'm, in my experience, <laughs> they don't have must. I don't think you're going to get this. I don't think One so. out of two. Uh, must, in the first sense, is new wine, grape juice before the fermentation is completed. But must, coming from a different route, is also a state of frenzy, which sometimes happens to elephants and camels. And you <laughs> want to avoid them when that happens. <laughs> One out of two. Well, you must never write in a film review, this film is a must. <laughs> 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 This film is a deranged camel. Yeah. <laughs> Dennis Norton, the beautiful slant-eyed maiden, agitated her punker with such vigour that Eric's dooley was broken. <laughs> agitated her punker. Well, they, they have a thing called a punker waller. Yes. It's a chap who pulls a string that agitates a fan. Yes, that bit's and right. The dooley? D-O-O-L-I-E. Uh -huh. Now, what's washing? That's not... No, that's Dobie. Dobie, yeah. Something he was wearing, I should think. No, I think not. One out of two. Mm -hmm. uh, Punker uh, was originally a, a fan you could carry, which made of leaves, and then became one of these rather special fixed swinging fan of cloth on a frame, worked, as uh, Dennis said, by Punker Waller, Punker Cooley. But the dooley is uh, simply an Indian litter, and presumably Eric was sitting or lying on this, originally used for transporting people in the rather lower orders and eventually as a sort of ambulance litter for taking army soldiers. I bet you I couldn't agitate know. a punker in such a way as it would break a dude. <laughs> <laughs> One up two. <laughs> and Scott James. The simple country gentleman called the waiter and pointed at his plate. And he said, the fact that my work is geoponic does not mean that I am addicted to geophagy with great dignity. Geophagy and geoponic. G-E-O-P-O-N-I-C and geophagy, P-H-A-G-Y. Well, geophagy means I don't want to eat the soil, I should think. That's right. Because geo means the earth. Yes. The fact that my work is connected with um, hydroponics yes. are growing things in water, geoponics are growing things in earth, yes. doesn't mean that I want to eat the stuff. That's right. And who are the chaps who are concerned with growing things in earth? This is supposed to be a simple country. <laughs> yes. Farmers. Yes, that's right. You've got a sophisticated <laughs> urban. <laughs> You've got it absolutely right. He was a farmer. It's one of those uh, restaurants where you can eat dirt cheap. <laughs> <laughs> um, geoponic, geoponic is a rather pedantic or jocular word for earth toil, agricultural. And the other one is um, geophagy. Is, and Scott James quite rightly says it's eating dirt. Frank Muir. 
The detective thrust his hand into Olga's muff. I saw you hide the muffineer in here, he said accusingly. M-U-F-F-I-N-E-R. Muffineer. Muffineer is actually a... It's, um, it's a thing. Yes? <laughs> it's a sort of um, hot water bottle for muffins. Yes, that'll do. It's a thing that you put hot water in a little spout to keep muffins warm. Absolutely right. There are two senses in which the word muffineer is used. I've been looking for one for eight years. <laughs> one is, a, and this is what Frank, I think, is describing, is a covered dish to keep muffins hot in, but it also was uh, a caster, a little caster, for sprinkling sugar, or some people spr sprinkled salt, apparently, on muffins. Well, now we come to the last round and go back to those quotations I gave the teams earlier in the programme. Two marks, it is power. Can you give me the origin of your quotation? A thing of beauty is a joy forever. It's by Keats. Yes. And it's the opening line of his sonnet. Sonnet? No, not sonnet. No. Not, much uh, ode. Ode. No, not an ode either. Ode? You're quite right, it's Keats. John it is the opening line, and it's the opening line of Endymion. This now, Anne Scott James, the origin of your quotation, please. Circumstances alter cases. It's a very dull remark, mm. and I would think it's from one of those books of Proverbs. It is, yes. I think that's good enough. Um, it's, there is some doubt where it was first quoted. A chap called Drayton, in the, right at the beginning of the 17th century, said, Circumstance doth make it good or ill. And it was afterwards used by Dickens and Edwin Drood and by Halliburton in 1837 in a play called The Old Judge. But you get your two marks. And now I'm going to ask Dennis and Frank to give me their explanations of how these quotations came into being. And on this occasion, the marks will go to whichever incredible explanation gets the longer applause from the audience here in the theatre. So back to Frank Muir and his quotation, A thing of beauty is a joy forever. Well, after last week's show, I went to the railway station at Waterloo and had about a quarter of an hour before the train left. So I went into the uh, buffet there for a cup of tea. And there was a chap opposite and said, Blasted tea not fit for pigs, this railway tea. But while he said that, I suddenly thought, Why should he lay down the law in this manner? What he really meant, that it was awful to him that he didn't like this particular kind of tea which railways serve up. And it, it set my fertile mind fertilising about this, this whole question of taste. It's like um, those plastered elves in gardens. You know, people, people laugh at people who have plastic elves in gardens, but it, millions of people in the country like plastic. In fact, it, in, in council estates, you, you know, every second house, in fact, council estates are so keen on it, they, they want them to come with the houses. <laughs> they want it to be provided by the government, a sort of national elf service. <laughs> <laughs> I think they'd be far better off with a gnome. <laughs> but why, why can't people have the things they like, even though they're sort of out of fashion or call bad taste? And particularly reverting to this chap and his tea, the whole matter of food. All you get, for instance, when you uh, think of going out to a restaurant, you look up the newspapers or uh, books, and they're all good food, the good food guide. I think I'm going to start a bad food guide because a lot of uh, food which other people don't like, I do like. For instance, whatever became of brisket? <laughs> whatever became of brawn? You go into an airport and ask for a brawn sandwich. <laughs> but a real sandwich with brawn and piccalilli, you know, where about road to Mandalay sandwiches where an hour afterwards the brawn comes up like thunder. <laughs> <laughs> These are what a sandwich should be, an inch and a half thick and crammed full. Custard. Custard should have a thick yellow plastic mac on the top. <laughs> In fact, it's chewing up the plastic mac, which is better than the stuff, the thin stuff underneath. I'm going to have a list of restaurants where you can get really good custard with a plastic mac on top. And the same with tea. What right has that man, that stockbroker, was to say that this is bad tea? There's a chap in our village 
named Arthur. Arthur Arbottle, his name is. Dear old Arthur, who's been retired, and he was a porter at Waterloo Station for 40 years. And occasionally for a treat, I take one of those billy can things that wear women have and fill it up at that canteen at Waterloo Station, the really strong tea, and I take it to him, and, and he loves it. And all this flashed my, through my mind as this chapter, this filthy tea. So I said to him, it's all a matter of taste, sir. You may think it is filthy. You may think that stuff is one degree this side of tomain poison. But I can only say that a, a thing of BRT is a joy for Arthur. <laughs> That's another man I'm never going to share a meal with again. And we'll go on to Dennis Norton, and his quotation was, Circumstances alter cases. Well, this quotation, or something that sounds very slightly like it, um, I came across, it was a headline in a paper that I found in a very small town in Ireland. And I can tell you that when it comes to small towns, there are no smaller towns <laughs> than the small ones in Ireland. This one was really just a street. And for some reason, they'd made one way. <laughs> but if by chance you missed it, you had to circle the globe in order to get back. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And I, I remember how small it was. The telephone dial only had one hole in it. <laughs> And I came across it by chance when I was on a walking tour of Southern Ireland. Now, I didn't mean to be on a walking tour of Southern Ireland. I was in Cork and I had three Irish coffees. <laughs> and I was now trying to remember where I'd parked my car. <laughs> and I came to this village and I decided to stay there. I don't know why, something about it attracted me. I think it was the name, Kilmuir. Um, <laughs> and I, I booked in uh, this little, at the one hotel, actually, and it was while I was shaving, it was borne on a, born upon me how small it was. Because when I switched on my electric razor, the street lamps dimmed. <laughs> I thought, oh well, early night. You know. <laughs> so I took up this local paper and I saw this headline which intrigued me so much that I got, went out the hotel to meet the subject of it, who was the local police sergeant. And he said to me, ah sir, he said, it is the story in the newspaper you'll be coming to see me about. I was sent here, sir, because the inhabitants of this town are people of regular habits. They get drunk every night. <laughs> he said, it is, not, it is not the drinking for which I was sent here. He said, it was the fighting and the brawling and the bloodshed afterwards. And my superiors said to me, we're sending you, Sergeant McGinty, to Kilmuir to get the violence off the streets, <laughs> back in the homes where it belongs. <laughs> <laughs> well now, sir, the worst offenders of all the local inhabitants were the O'Casey family, sir. Savages. Savages, that's what they were, sir. The head of the family had a fist, Garris, the size of your head, and her husband was just as bad. <laughs> Bloodthirsty. And I said, it's got to stop this terrorising, this banging of neighbours' heads on the stone pavements. It's bad for the tourism. <laughs> And they said, but Sergeant, what else is there to do in the evenings? Well, because sir, I, I had to stop and think. Because in a small Irish town, there is very little else to do but feuding and fighting and folk singing. And I said to them, whatever there is, you pull yourself together now. Next time you feel like a fight, take a cold shower. <laughs> now that didn't work, sir. <laughs> Within three months, the central government had declared the district a drought area. 
So I had to think of some other way to stop the O'Casey family from feuding and fighting in the streets. And it was then I ran across old Dr. Milligan. Now there's a clever man, sir. There's a man as clever as many of them has got degrees. <laughs> and I told him my problem, and he, very interested he was, sir. He sat up in that gutter. And he said to me, what you have to do, Sergeant, is you have to channel this violence. You have to channel it into another form of physical activity. So I said, well, what other form of physical activity can I channel it into, sir? And he said, well, I've got 16 children. I think it had better be dancing. <laughs> so he said, that's, that, sir, is when I started the cause of that headline in the paper, Me Weekly Dances. We took the old barn, and every week the O'Casey family are there now. And what with all the waltzing and the reeling and the intermissioning? <laughs> He said, they've got no time and no strength left for fighting. And that's why I got the headline, sir, in the local paper. And I looked at this headline, and I thought, if that's not a lesson for the whole world, well, at least it's something for my word. <laughs> because it read, Sergeant's Dances Halt O'Cases. <laughs> <laughs> By your vote, ladies and gentlemen, the contest of the two stories is won by Dennis Norton, but we have a final score in which there is a tie between Frank Muir and Dillis Powell on one side and Dennis Norton and Anne Scott James on the other. And that brings to an end this edition of My Word. <laughs> In My Word, you heard Dillis Powell, Anne Scott James, Frank Muir and Dennis Norton, introduced by Jack Longland. The programme was devised by Tony Shryan and Edward J. Mason and presented by the BBC.